6.55 of the COMSOP is heating and ventilation. It's very important that you understand the COMSOP before you perform any portions of the heating inspection on one of your commercial property inspections. I want to introduce a little bit uh, before we get started on boilers is talking about what our scope is. Largely, a commercial property inspection for heating and ventilation is an inventory. It's letting our clients know what's present. As we're doing that, we're going to describe what the heating source is and how it functions. So with that, today we're going to look at boilers. Very specifically, warm water boiler. We're here in the House of Horrors and I have a static boiler. This is a boiler that was donated to us uh, because it's failed. Uh, we don't have it so that it functions. We don't have it so I can turn it on and actually show you the operations. But we'll talk about all of that as we go. As part of the COMSOP, we only operate our systems with normal controls. That is the thermostat and or the on and off switch. We do not, I repeat, we should never operate a unit if it is shut down. So if you come to a unit and it is in a shutdown state, note it, document everything else, but don't operate that unit. So as we're looking at, the, at any HVAC unit, one of the first things we should identify is, is do we have access to it? There's three pieces of access we need to understand. One, there needs to be a permanent access if any unit is installed higher than 16 feet off the ground. That means you don't have to have your ladder if it's higher than 16 feet off the ground. Two, we need to have a 30 inch working area in front of it. No storage, nothing impeding your working space. So if I have 30 inches around this unit, that's the entire, circum that's the entire diameter of this unit. We need to have 30 inches wider so that we can get to it safely and be able to identify everything. And then the last of our three is if there's any unit placed on a sloped roof greater than 25% slope, then that same working platform must be there in a perfectly horizontal space. So with that, let's take a look at our boiler and talk about it. Now, there's two types of boilers that we'll have in a commercial property. One is warm water, one is steam. Warm water uses water heated up to uh, and less than 212 degrees at sea level, which is boiling, and the other one exceeds that and creates boiling water. They operate very similarly, but different, and have very different pieces. And so with that, uh, let's, f let's first talk about the different pieces that'll be between a steam water, a steam system, and a warm water system. First, all warm water systems will be driven with a pump. We have to have some means of moving water. Two, all warm water systems will have an expansion tank. That's a tank that, that, that if water exceeds its, ma its maximum temperature, which is really close to boiling, it's a spot for that to expand to cool and come back to the system. And, and a steam system will have no pump, and on the side of it will have a sight glass. We've talked about the sight glass in, in other courses. And so it'll have a sight glass, and that sight glass actually reads the amount of water that's in the tank. And so those are a couple of the different parts that'll be different between a steam system and a warm water system. But, before the, but beyond that, let's take a look at this unit specifically. When you, when you approach the unit, you should always take the cover off. And so with this, I'm able to take the cover off of this unit and identify anything going on. The first thing we should always identify is the power service disconnect. There needs to be a power service disconnect within line of sight of this unit. Now this is a non-functioning unit. The power disconnect was removed. It was at one point attached to this piece of conduit. It's no longer there. Additionally, there should always be some form of service receptacle, an outlet for the technician to work on, uh, and that goes with any HVAC unit, and there should always be lighting, some form of luminaire, unless it's outside. If it's outside, there's not typically a light installed, but if it's an inside unit, then there should be a light somewhere to, to illuminate this so that the, any technician or inspector does not have to carry some form of illumination to be able to operate on this unit. Now, we've identified the switch. 
We've taken a look at the unit. Let's look at a few other parts and we'll kind of describe those parts as we go. The first very important part that we should always identify on any boiler, and that could go with steam or warm water, would be the water service disconnect. That's right here. This services the water from the municipality and that turns everything off before the water goes through the unit. This would be in the event of some catastrophic failure, I'm able to shut the unit down. The next part beyond the water shutoff will be our, our pressure reducing valve. Now, most municipalities provide water pressure at a static amount, somewhere in between 40 and 60 pounds per square inch, depending on your municipality and where you're located on that grid, or even a well. A well will provide a static water pressure. A boiler system is considered to be a low pressure system. What a low pressure system is, is it's something that operates much less pounds per square inch than the water supply. And so a pressure reducing valve, which is this valve right here, takes the pressure from the service, drops it down to a working pressure somewhere under 25 PSI, and it drops it and fill, fills in the system. The pressure reducing valve services two roles. The first role is to drop the pressure, and the second role is to auto fill the unit. If we have any evaporation or loss in water for any reason, this is constantly allowing water to flow into the system at that reduced pressure and constantly fill. Some systems might not have a pressure reducing valve. Um, while that, that might be considered an efficiency, that could be how it was designed. And in that case, that system might be designed where the valve is shut off and some technician is going there regularly several times a day and actually opening up the valve and introducing water and then shutting it down. That's a very old way of doing it, but when you have a stationary engineer in a boiler room, that might be his sole responsibility is to keep that valve going. So we got the shutoff valve, we go to the pressure reducing valve. I talked about expansion tanks. Yeah, our expansion tank is right here on this particular unit. There's a couple different types of expansion tanks. This is called a bladder tank. And what it is, it's a sealed tank with a, with, with a Schrader valve on the bottom of it, like a bike tire valve. And inside of here is a bladder attached to the steel. And as water gets introduced into here, it expands the bladder and then the bladder pushes it back in. And what that does is that prevents the system from boiling. If you think about a teapot on your stove, that teapot will boil water and get up to the temperature, and then you'll hear it leash off or, or whistle. One of the, there are two ways in which you can prevent that water from boiling. One, shut off the heat source, and two, take the lid off. So this is ostensibly like the lid or, or, or the place where the water gets to expand as it boils. Then a couple of the other parts that we're going to have is, is all warm water systems have to have some means of moving water through the building. In this particular case, it's a pump. There are two types of pumps we've talked about in this, in this course. One, one pump is a sealed pump, maintenance free. And it just runs until it fails and then it's replaced. And the other one is a maintenance pump, which is in a three-part system. And we have the, the motor, the pump, and the bearing, and those require maintenance several times a, a heating season, uh, which is introducing some form of lubrication, uh, a, a small motor oil to the system, and that allows it to, uh, to stay lubricated. Both pumps should be almost silent during operation. Any noise, any rattle, any, any shaking, any vibrations, any, any, any motor sounds is usually a cause for, for alarm and uh, potential failure to that portion of the system. Now, as we, as we move around the system, the last, a couple of the last things we'll look at on a warm water system, there's always a gauge. The gauge is called a tridicator gauge. It's a tridicator gauge because it reads temperature, pressure, and maximum temperature of the system. The maximum temperature is something that was set by the technician. 
When I, we call these boilers, we're using a, a, a kind of a generic name. A boiler for a warm water system isn't a boiler. It is a, uh, a warm water heating vessel uh, that gets up to but below boiling. That water temperature is set by a technician. There are lots of variables to go into what the water temperature should be. That's why we don't record water temperature. Uh, one could be uh, the design of the heat emitting devices, the radiators. Whether we have in floor, in slab, in wall, in ceiling, whether we have large cast iron radiators, whether we have small lineal copper finned radiators, all of those go into effect of what the water temperature should be as this device heats the water. And so, so that gauge is merely a gauge to give you reference that water got heated. Nothing really more than that as far as our, our purposes go. And then the last device, which is on the back of this that I want to talk about right now, is the temperature pressure relief valve. There are lots of temperature pressure relief valves on the market, um, and each of them has a different purpose. The purpose of this is it's an emergency valve that if the water pressure or temperature inside the system exceeds the valve, then the valve will expel its water or, 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 or steam, if it's really hot, down to within six inches of the floor. Not unlike what we'd have for a normal water heater inspection. That valve needs to discharge to within six inches of the floor. So if we walk up to this valve and it's dripping or leaking or, or a weesh of any type, then we know it's failed and we know there's something going on. But when I, when I mentioned about there's a lot of different valves we can buy, each valve is rated, and there will be a rating plate on the valve. Some are rated uh, at, at 30 PSI, like this one. Some are rated up to 150 PSI. And so it's important that the right valve is installed. It's very easy to, go to, to have a technician go to their vehicle, grab the wrong valve, put it on. They're all, they're all threaded the same. They all look the same, except for each of them is labeled differently. And so it's important when we're looking at a warm water system that that relief valve is a low pressure or 30 PSI valve. If I was to put a 150 PSI valve, one like might be on a water heater, then this would potentially fail long before this valve fails. And so it's important to take a look at that as, uh, as we're going through. Now, that's the basic parts. Of, of any boiler. Now we will go on to the next portion of the boiler, then we'll have its flue parts. Now when we're looking at the flue parts, um, every boiler is a little different. This is a natural drafting flue. We could have an induced flue. We could have a high efficiency flue. But in this particular, in this particular case, I've got, uh, I've got a flue that comes off of it. I've got a draft hood here. And then our products of, of combustion would discharge going upward through the roof. And so we want to identify to make sure that that's intact. We don't have any leakage or things going on. One of the easiest ways that you can, use, that you can tell if there is any flue gas leakage would, a couple ways would be if there's excessive rust around the draft hood, but a lot of, a lot of inspectors might use something as simple as, as their phone glass. And if you put your phone glass next to the draft hood as it's running, and it condenses or creates some moisture on the glass, that's a good indication that we've got some form of spillage coming out. And so that's a nice way to, to, to use a non-analytical or, or non-testing tool and using something that's very visual, which is what we're doing. This is a visual walkthrough and not a uh, technically exhaustive walkthrough using uh, very sophisticated tools. Then. Also, as part of our boiler inspection, we should probably take a look at our gas pipe. We typically have a, a shutoff valve, a coupling, and then we'd be able to go in and go through the system. Once we've identified everything, then uh, it's time to operate the unit. So let's, let's go through the operating cycle now. We've created an inspection checklist for you to consider following. And it will follow this entire system and go through the entire process of what you would do to create a good, thorough boiler inspection. 
So let's follow that checklist. The first item on the checklist is to look at the cabinet. You take the door cover off and you look at the cabinet. I'm looking for rust, I'm looking for scale, I'm looking for debris, I'm looking for standing water. On, a, on, on most boilers, everything that you can see standing right here is a replaceable item. I can replace gas valves, I can replace anything on this system. But typically what I can't replace is the heat exchanger or the kettle or whatever that device is that's warming the water. And so, so that would be located in here. And so if I had water dripping of any type, then that would certainly be a sign that we're gonna have a failure. Our second item on our checklist is to look for that 30 inches. That would be this entire area around the boiler. Do I have access? And so I wanna verify that I have 30 inches of access. All boilers, all appliances, everything in the building will have a label plate. Our label plate is located right here. And so recording the information, taking a photo of that label plate will help me know the size, the manufacturer, the fuel, if I already didn't know it wasn't gas, and, uh, and possibly get the date. All those items should be recorded uh, for, for your client. It helps them understand the uh, average useful life and things like that. While, while we don't have to report on useful life, it'll give them that information so they know how old this appliance is. When we have boilers in a commercial building, especially multifamily or the larger boilers, they typically have some form of government license attached to them. The fire marshal comes and inspects them uh, on some interval, depending on, on where you're at. I've seen some intervals to be yearly. I've seen some to be every three to five years. So, but there should be some government tag somewhere around this unit. So that's something we can take a look at. I always take and make sure that I, I have some photographic record of that on my report. Our fifth item would be to locate the water shutoff. Our sixth is the pressure reducing valve. Both of those are usually above it or next to it or somewhere on that system. We've always got a main power disconnect. So we want to locate that. And then while the system might be running or not running, it really depends on, on where you're at in the cycle. You want to just look for any water. Water at the pipes, water at the system, anywhere. Look for standing water. Verify your temperature pressure relief valve. Identify your circulation pump. I usually put my hand on the circulation pump. I want to feel for vibrations. I want to listen for noise. And then I verify my expansion tank. I've noted, I noted all those. Again, I'm going to look for all the pipes and supports and leaks. You can't do that enough. I look at my triticator, make sure that it's in place. I look at the gas system, make sure that I have a drip leg, a shutoff, the couplings. I don't use any technically exhaustive tools. You absolutely could use a tool. You could use any type of gas testing tool that you would like and test for gas leaks around the system. You could use a spray bottle with soap if you'd like to look and be able to visually take a picture of gas leaks in the system, or you could just smell and smell for gas leaks in the system. But I want to look for that, and then I want to turn the system on. By turning the system on, that means I've got to go to the thermostat, and I've got to activate the thermostat. Now, how these systems operate within the checklist um, is inside of this unit is a pressure switch. Whenever water passes past the pressure switch, it senses the temperature loss of the water and the burners will ignite. And so really, the thermostat is controlling the pump. The movement of the water controls the burners. And so when the pump is activated and the burners come on, then I am firing heat through the system. It'd be at that stage that I want to walk around wherever that building is and look at all the heat emitting devices, the radiators. I want to look for leaks. I want to make sure they have heat. That's one in my hand. So your boiler inspection could be segmented. It could be go into the building, crank the thermostat, 
go around, check the heat, make sure every radiator is producing heat, then go back and then check the system. It's whatever is most fluid for you and gives you the most economy of your time, but you do have to check the heat emitting devices, those radiators that are through the building. And then when I'm all done and I verify this, then that's when I go back to the thermostat and turn the heat back to where it was when I arrived. It's very important you do not want to have heat left on after your inspection because that'll cause uh, a great deal of angst and disappointment to all those that uh, might refer you later. Now, this system is set up very similar to about any other commercial system that you'll see as that it is zoned. Let's talk about zoning for a minute. One of the wonderful things about a, a hydronic or a boiler system is that it's, it's very easily zonable. It's zonable by just adding more pipes. The one boiler, especially this size, can heat quite a bit of building and quite a, quite a few zones. There are a lot of different ways that we zone systems. One, we could have multiple loops and multiple pumps. Each pump operates a different zone. Another way is one pump, which we have in this situation, one pump, but in the return side here, I have three different valves. These valves open and close based on a thermostat. And so each one of these three zones could be a different apartment or a different zone in that building attached to a thermostat. So whenever that thermostat says, I would like more heat, then this opens up and then when that opens up, water's moving. So really that pump never shuts off. Water's always running through the system and it only shuts off um, when the temperature is proven or these valves disconnect. And so in this particular case, I've got three zones. So that would mean I'd have to go through this building and exercise three different thermostats in three different areas to make sure each one of those is the ability to control this. So zones are very popular in, co in commercial buildings, multifamily, or just about any type of commercial building you will have, but in multifamily especially. Now the interesting thing about hydronic systems is once you understand and can wrap your arms around this size unit, dealing with one the size of a locomotive or the size of a room in a basement of a building doesn't operate any differently. Once you understand your scope, once you understand what you're doing and how they work, they've all got a shutoff switch, they've all got a pressure reducing valve, they might have lots of zones or lots of pumps, but it's really the same way. Follow the standards of practice, understand the systems, and know where you, your limits are, and you'll be an awesome commercial building inspector.